I'm going to tell you my story about how I ended up in the emergency room of my local hospital and found the most fragile, the most deficient, and the single most important nutrient for all of humanity. So follow me with this one. This is a good story. So if you've been watching my videos, you know that I had black mold poisoning in 2016. And actually earlier, I was in a moldy office for 13 years. My very first symptoms were actually in 2009, and they were all heart-related. Shortness of breath, left arm pain and numbness, high blood pressure. I even had swollen feet, and I had um, pain throughout my chest. But in January of 2016, it was really, really bad. I thought I was going to die. And that year, I had four EKGs trying to discover why I had these heart symptoms. And at the time, I'm thinking, is it my toothpaste? Is it my water? This is what everybody goes through when they have chronic illness. They're trying to figure out, why do I feel this way? One of my EKGs, which was in August of 2016, in Florida, in the summer, it was really hot and humid, that EKG showed a possible MI, which means possible heart attack. My troponin level in the blood test was normal, so I did not officially have a heart attack. But it felt like it, in that my heart was skipping and beating and pinching and pain across my chest and down my arm. During this time, I figured out a mechanism of chronic disease called lactic acidosis by reading old books from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when all of medicine was all about feeding studies and nutrition. The vitamin discovery era was the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s. All of that ended because of World War II, and a lot of that great information has actually been forgotten or intentionally removed from our culture. And in the story, you're going to see exactly why and what is the most important nutrient, and you'll see exactly why it was removed. So in October of 2016, I actually found the mold in the office. Then I knew, okay, I can either move out of the office or get it fixed. I knew my landlord would never fix it, so I was intent on moving out. It took a year and a half to get into a new office. In the meantime, I started detoxing mold. I used a product called Biotoxin Binder. I took two pills a day for seven years. Over the course of the first initial six months after having moved out of the office, I started feeling better. My chest pain daily was reducing to not daily, which was a great improvement. And in 2019, I was doing really well. I started the carnivore diet. I did that hardcore for that full year. I was going to the gym once or twice a week. I, I, my health was fantastic. And then 2020 started, that's the COVID lockdown. And I was really angry because nobody has the right to shut down my office, blah, blah, blah. There's stress and stories behind that. And it continued through 21 and 22. And then in the summer of 23, I accepted an invitation to speak in front of 175 medical doctors. And it was uh, me being a, a carnivore eater and carnivore doctor versus a vegan on stage. And I did a video about that. And you can see that right here above me. So from July of 23 until February of 24, I studied really, really hard. And I learned some amazing things. I put more videos up on my YouTube channel in the fall of 23 about LDL cholesterol, etc. So I did a lot of studying and I used my brain a lot and still going to the gym and eating a low carb diet. I've been eating a low carb diet since 1999. So after the lecture in February of 24, I started getting these old symptoms back. So we're talking March, April, May of 2024. I started getting these symptoms back, crushing chest pain, high blood pressure, shortness of breath, left arm numbness. Those were my four main symptoms. I even had a little bit of left leg numbness. In the middle of May, I stayed the night at a house that I usually don't sleep in, and the door was closed and the windows were closed, but yet the ventilation was not on. The air conditioning and the heater, they were not turned on because it's that time of year in Michigan when you don't turn on your heater and you don't turn on your air conditioner. I woke up at 3 a.m., the room was stuffy, I opened up a window, but outside the air was still, so I didn't get a breeze. So I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, and my blood pressure was 135 over 85. For me, that's crazy high, and it, it had been that way for six weeks. And as the sun was rising, it shined into the picture window, and the living room was getting hotter and hotter, and the chest pain was getting worse and worse. By 9 a.m., I had crushing chest pain, 8 out of 10. My blood pressure was 139 over 102. And I was short of breath, and I told my parents, I'm out of here. I'm going to urgent care. I'm driving back to Ann Arbor. So I packed up my stuff, drove to urgent care, and they did an EKG. It was normal. They said, you have to go to the ER. We can't draw blood or do any other tests. So, so I chose to go to a local small hospital, not the big University of Michigan hospital. 
And I walk in at 1130. They put me in an emergency room bed at 1145. I got all these cords hooked up to me. And then they left for an hour. They walked out of the room. They did not say, we'll be back in an hour. They did not say, we're going to lunch. They just left without saying anything. So there's nothing for me to do except for search on my phone. But my phone was on the chair on the other side of the room, so I couldn't get it. And all I could do was watch my monitor. So I'm watching my monitor, and my respirations were like this. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. I had five to eight seconds between respirations. I'm watching myself not breathe on the monitor. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. If I hold my breath, doesn't that raise blood pressure? And I started freaking out about this a little bit. I was like, okay, I got to calm down. I'm in the ER. Let me just calm down. And then I fell asleep. And then the monitor starts beeping and it was red and it said apnea 20 seconds. So I wake up to that and I'm like, okay, I have apnea. I am not breathing. And I think I'm not breathing in the office. What would happen if I just started breathing intently? So I did. And for the next 20 minutes, I was just breathing in, out, in, out with effort. There was effort there. And the blood pressure came on every 10 minutes. So after 20 minutes, my top number, which I said was around, it was 138. It dropped 18 points in 20 minutes down to 120. So it was 120 over 82 after just breathing. And I got really happy about this. And then they came back and they're going to put a needle in my arm. And they said, look, the monitor shows apnea. Doesn't that raise blood pressure? And the guy says, well, it usually means that the cord fell off or the skin contact was bad. It's usually a bad reading. And I was like, no, I think it was, I'm thinking to myself, I don't breathe in the office. And this monitor is telling me I don't breathe at night. So I agreed to do a CT scan of the brain with dye contrast, looking for a stroke. And they drew some blood. And I told them my oxidized LDL level is normal. My cholesterol has always been normal. There's nothing wrong with my blood test except for lipoprotein A. That's usually high, but that alone is not an indicator of heart disease. But everything else for the last 25, 30 years has always been normal. And they said, I believe you. So five hours go by and they discharge me. And she sat down and she goes, we don't know what it is. I said, the monitor showed apnea. It's apnea. And she goes, well, okay, go get a sleep study. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to get a sleep study. I know how to fix apnea. I've been fixing it for 15 years with my patients. So I go to the office. I grab supplements. I start taking them. And even the very next day, I was doing better. And I was in focusing on breathing quite intently. And for the next week, I was doing better. Now, there was still some struggle there. If the air got stale in the office or I caught myself not breathing when I'm typing, then the pain would come back. I could tell my blood pressure was going up. It was a little bit rough. But then the very next week, I was with a patient and we're on a video conference and she's doing better with her program with all of her symptoms. And she says to me, oh, by the way, I've been taking high dose B1 for four months and all of my neuropathy is gone. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I have neuropathy. Maybe I need B1. I have high dose B1 in my office. So I did this muscle testing procedure that we do to determine what the body needs. It's a form of biofeedback. And I needed three pills of benfotiamine. So I immediately took three pills. And within one hour, I was breathing so much easier. It was amazing. And I'm telling my staff, like, look, the breathing was incredibly easier compared to earlier. And I knew that this is the product that's going to save my life. So within two weeks of me taking high dose synthetic B1, my high blood pressure was normal. All my apnea was gone. My chest pain was gone. My shortness of breath was gone. Two weeks is all it took. So I immediately started researching into synthetic B1s. There's many versions of it. And I was reading PubMed and watching videos on YouTube. And I learned an amazing amount of information very quickly. And it all goes back to what I started teaching seven, eight years ago on YouTube about lactic acidosis. That's a mechanism of chronic disease. So here's waste or toxins in your blood, in your body, especially in your blood. So W for waste, O for oxygen. 
If you have too much waste and not enough oxygen, you get sick. So you want to bring down the waste, and that's the infections and the toxins, etc., and the bad diet. Then you want to raise up the oxygen. That's the basis of healing from chronic illness. So when I've talked about raising up oxygen before, I was mentioning Catapex B and other products from Standard Process. Catapex B has one milligram of B1, also known as thiamine. But what got me better was 750 milligrams of B1 per day. This version of B1 has 150 milligrams per capsule, and this version of B1 has 50 milligrams per capsule. I was taking both versions. They do different things. Now, B1 deficiency symptoms come in three categories. Number one, neurological. Number two, cardiovascular. And number three, GI. Classical beriberi, which is the disease name of B1 deficiency, means I can't, I can't, meaning I can't breathe, or I can't think, or I can't do activities, I can't walk. And there was a study done many decades ago in Japan where they had adults who were given a B1 deficient diet for one month, and they were expecting neurological and cardiovascular symptoms. In that group of people, nobody got any of those symptoms, but they all got GI problems. And when I say GI problems, it's the words that you may have heard of, leaky gut, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. These could all possibly be from a B1 deficiency. The classical cardiovascular symptoms are enlarged heart, high blood pressure, weakness in the muscles, shortness of breath, and quite frankly, any other cardiovascular condition. The cardiovascular symptoms could be as small as a little pinch right here, all the way to heart attack, congestive heart failure, and death. The neurological symptoms could be as small as forgetfulness, all the way to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, coma, and death. B1 deficiency has been known for centuries, especially in Japan, Korea, and China when they're eating white rice. They polish the brown out of the rice as a status symbol and to make the shelf life longer. Well, the brown part of the rice is the B vitamins. So in Japan in the 1960s, they added chemistry to the B1 molecule to make it more absorbable into the body, especially into the nervous system and through the cell membranes, which are made out of fat. For example, this benfotiamine was made in the 1960s. Now my whole career teaching for nutrition companies and going to nutrition seminars, I've never had a seminar where somebody talked about B1. I was a little bit anti B vitamins or synthetic B vitamins for the last 30 years until May 28th when I knew that this stuff was gonna save my life. And I've probably been deficient of this since 2009 when I first had the mold symptoms because the mycotoxins from aspergillus mold crushes B1 in the body, it destroys it. What else destroys B1 in the body? Parasites, also stress. And maybe you had stress 20 years ago, like you got fired from a job or you lost a loved one and you were never the same since. Or if you know somebody, they had some very traumatic thing happen in their life, they've never been the same since. That's because they lost their B1 within a few hours or within three days. B1 is water soluble, it's very fragile. It's very easily depleted out of the body. Now, benfotiamine and this other type of B1, this is called TTFD, which is the acronym for the chemical. These are made to be fat soluble, so they're not as fragile, but natural B1 is not very stable and you only store 30 milligrams of it in your body. And oftentimes that's not enough with our hectic lifestyles and the stress that we have. So if you had stress in the past or you have stress currently, you probably need some high dose synthetic B1. So what does B1 do in your body? It does several vital things. Number one, it makes sure that the oxygen in your blood crosses over and gets into your cells. Now you can be breathing just fine, but you have pseudo hypoxia, meaning the oxygen is not getting into your body. It's staying in your blood. And that was discovered in 1929 by Dr. Otto Warburg. He won the Nobel prize for that in 1931. And he gave the lecture at the Nobel conference called the oxygen transferring ferment of respiration. The ferment of respiration is B1. They also called it the respiratory enzyme and they also called it the vitamin in 1926. So back in that era, they had different names for it. They put it in food for the first time in 1934 and it saved people's lives immediately. 
there were 10 year old boys having heart attacks because all they could afford was white bread and there was no nutrition in that white bread. It was just starch. So once they put B1 in there, their congestive heart failure, their heart enlargement, there's swelling in their ankles and in their legs and in their, in their lungs, all that went away within weeks. So medicine was like, okay, great, we're done. But yet now we have a huge number of people deficient B1, even though we have plenty of food. In 1934, there was very little food because of the Great Depression. And there was very low calories per person. Now we have high calories per person, but yet a deficiency in B1. That's called high calorie malnutrition. This video is brought to you by my office. We use new and old clinical discoveries, solving complex chronic illnesses using only diet and supplements. We have this fantastic building. We have multiple practitioners. We do local and distance consultations. We help you improve your health as opposed to just squashing. We help you improve your health as opposed to just squashing symptoms. And we have a variety of opportunities for you to get involved. We have eBooks and courses that are free. We have eBooks and courses that are paid for. I have my large seven step blueprint to optimal health online course, which walks you through the seven step blueprint to optimal health. And you have access to all the supplements at patient pricing. My book is available on Kindle. If you want to buy supplements from my office, we have this store, which is for patients only. And we have this store, which is for everybody else. But if you just want to jump into direct care immediately, just contact the office directly. This book right here is written by the world's leading expert in vitamin B1 deficiency. His name is Dr. Derek Lonsdale, co-authored by Chandler Mars, who's a PhD. It's called Thiamine Deficiency, which is B1, Dysautonomia and High Calorie Malnutrition. Dysautonomia means that your brainstem isn't working very well, so therefore your autonomic nervous system is not working very well. That's what I had. That's why I wasn't breathing very well. I had five to eight seconds between respirations. Dysautonomia. The autonomic nervous system was not controlling my diaphragm. It wasn't making it go up and down. There's other versions of dysautonomia, such as POTS. You may have heard of that, where you stand up and get dizzy. And then some people walk with a wide gait like they're drunk, and they don't know where their body is in space. That's called giddiness. It's, giddiness means a swimming sensation. When I went to the ER, they wrote that on my file that I had giddiness. I didn't know what that meant, so I had to look it up. And I did have that, a swimming sensation, because my nervous system was not doing very well. So when you add in B1, it nourishes the nervous system better than any other nutrient. Now, your phrenic nerve, which controls your diaphragm, comes from the back of the neck, C3, 4, and 5. And then the brainstem is where your vagus nerve comes from, and that controls your digestion, the churning of the stomach, peristalsis in the intestines, and control of the gallbladder and the whole uh, digestive system. Now, you can have local control of the digestive system. For example, the stomach makes acid, and that goes towards the gallbladder, which then shoots out bile. If you don't have high enough acid, then the bile doesn't get shot out of the gallbladder. That's local control. But what about distant control from the vagus nerve, from the brainstem back here? So that's another factor that people don't talk about. And now in my office, in the last two months, we've put about 200 people on B1. And I'm going to say that it is the single most important nutrition factor for human health. And we've had the greatest effects for our patients to get better by taking B1. I've had people who are stuck with their health and the B1 has been the answer. I have a patient who's a fitness model. She's been with me for 15 years and she's a chiropractor. She takes care of her health. She's got people in her family that do nutrition like I do. Nothing has ever worked for her. If she takes a supplement and it works, it only works for two days at the most. Going on for 15 years now. I put her on B1 and now she's getting better. I have many stories like this. People's health who's been devastated by stress, mold, parasites, etc., and B1 has been their savior just like it was mine. In this book, there's plenty of case histories about people getting better with B1, but check this out. This book from 1944, same story. They have a whole chapter on B1 deficiency. It's filled with clinical stories of people getting better, heart disease going away, neurological problems going away, and this is from 1944. And this book is from 1931, talking about B deficiency in humans and animals. And at the time, they called it the antineuritic vitamin. Neuritic means inflammation of the nervous system. It's been almost 100 years we've known about this. If I had walked in the hospital and they gave me some B1 and said, 
We're going to lunch. See you in an hour. I would have been better by the time they came back. When I go to my local home improvement store, there's a guy outside that sells hot dogs. That's what they need to do at hospitals. And instead of selling hot dogs, they need to sell vitamins. So you're walking in, oh, I got chest pain. Here's your vitamin B1. Here's your vitamin C. Good luck in there. I know at University of Michigan Hospital, one of the leading research and student hospitals in the country, they have a policy, no vitamins. Now I need to say, I have no clogged arteries. In that hospital visit, the brain MRI showed my arteries are completely clean and clear. I've since had a screening from lifelinescreening.com showing that my peripheral circulation in my ankles are fine. I have carotid arteries are wide open and my abdominal aorta is perfectly healthy. My heart disease symptoms were simply from a B1 deficiency and nothing else. Now, if I had a bad diet, if I'd been eating bread and sugar for the last 35 years, they could have found something blocking in my arteries. They would have blamed all my symptoms on that blocked artery, but I have no blocked arteries. There are people with blocked arteries, they get that opened up, they put a stent in, yet that person still has heart disease. They're still going to get another blocked artery. It could very well be a B1 deficiency because B1 deficiency causes blocked arteries. It also causes insulin resistance. It also causes fatty liver. That's metabolic syndrome. That's the high blood pressure. B1 deficiency might be the single most important nutritional deficiency in the modern world. Let's talk about diet. I've had a low carb diet since 1999. What are the diets that cause a B1 deficiency? A high carb diet, junk food diet, standard American diet, and the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet being high fat means that there's no B vitamins in fat because they're water soluble. And the point is that there is no diet that can replenish the B1 in the high dose that you might need. You have to take a pill. Luckily, it's pretty cheap. The cheapest version of B1 is the B1 salt, such as thiamine hydrochloride or thiamine mononitrate. It's only 5 to 10% absorbable, and it's not fat soluble like these two that I showed you. My purpose in life since 1997 has been to bankrupt drug companies. Vitamin B1 is the single greatest nutri nutrient to do that job. If everybody's B1 status in their body was high, then these chronic diseases such as insulin resistance, high blood pressure, chest pain, cardiovascular, GI, neurological, all those things can be dropped dramatically. As a matter of fact, there's a lab test called the Metabolic Vulnerability Index, which I did a video right here about that. And that's a measurement of six factors in your blood. And then they give you a score between zero to 100. If your score is zero, the chance of you dying in the next five years is very low. If your score is 90, the chance of you dying in the next five years is extremely high. It's the best way to predict how long you're going to live in your disease slash health state. It's not LDL. It's not age. It's not how many push-ups you can do. It's not how fit you are. It's these six factors. Three of those factors are amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those three amino acids, when they're high, prevent the liver from digesting fat. Then you get a fatty liver. Then you get metabolic syndrome, you get diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease, etc. When you bring those amino acids down, now the liver can get the fat out of it. What's the single most important nutrient to get those three amino acids down to the normal level? B1. I'll do a video about this. This is the most ground-shaking, earth-shattering information about living longer it has to do with vitamin B1. Now, I mentioned that it raises oxygen faster than anything else in the blood. And then I'm also mentioning that it heals the nervous system better than any other nutrient, and including the brainstem, and the uh, therefore the digestive system and the breathing could get better. But also peripherally, it fixes circulation so swollen ankles can go away, and neuropathy in the feet can go away too with high doses of B1. Now, when you take B1, you might need some additional support, such as magnesium, amino acids, potassium, electrolytes, selenium, etc. I go over that in another video. 
Lastly, B1 is essential for mitochondrial function. So mitochondria is where your body makes energy, and B1 does, is in charge of five different biochemical reactions, including step one, which is bringing fuel into the mitochondria. If you don't have that, what's the point? Nothing else works. It's a rate limiting factor. Your improvement in your whole body from chronic disease is dependent on B1. So to conclude, it repairs the nervous system from the brain all the way down. It repairs the digestive system and it repairs the cardiovascular system and the transportation of oxygen from the blood to the cells. It also contributes to the removal of carbon dioxide from the cells into the blood. So what happens when you have too much carbon dioxide in your body? Carbon dioxide is waste. There's a term called cachexia. Caca means poop, exia means to hold on to. So we can't exhale very well. You're not getting your carbon dioxide out. You can get cachexia. You're holding on to your poop, your, your ex expiration breath. And I'm not talking constipation. I'm talking about the metabolism of your cells and the function of your lungs. Now, a severe B1 deficiency can also cause a lack of appetite. It makes you feel full. A severe B1 deficiency makes you feel full. I experienced that for about two or three days when I was doing really poorly before I went to the ER. I made breakfast twice and I made dinner once and I'm looking at this food. I was not hungry for it. I was losing weight. I had cachexia. I was holding on to my poop, my carbon dioxide, and my B1 deficiency made me feel full. It was not a good time. Where are the people that have cachexia? They're in the hospital. Where are the people that need the B1 the most? Those people in the hospital. At any one time, there's about 800,000 Americans in hospitals in the United States. Who are the people that need B1 the most? They're the ones that are the sickest. Who are the people that need to take B1 to prevent being sick? That's you. I have made six more PowerPoint presentations, and these are the titles. Number one, B1 deficiency and cardiovascular disease and symptoms. Number two, B1 deficiency and GI gastrointestinal diseases and symptoms. Number three, B1 deficiency and neurological diseases and symptoms. Those are the first three PowerPoints that I made. I also made measuring B1 and measuring longevity. That's the metabolic vulnerability index that I mentioned. The single most important lab test that you can get, and it's not available yet. I'm calling labs. I called the NIH. I'm trying to get people to run this lab. And then the last one is about dosing B1 and the different forms of B1 and how to take it and what to expect, how long you should be on it for, and dosing related to your symptoms. I'll also talk about the support products. There's about 15 or so products that you may need to help your body use B1 because once you're taking B1, now your mitochondria are working better and they require 22 nutrients to work well. So that includes selenium, that includes sulfur, iron, and all these other nutrients. So that's in that last PowerPoint. Now going to the ER was not fun and it cost me $10,000 with the cash discount. I do not have health insurance. But it was a good career move because I learned this information and it's not anything new that I've known in the last eight years when I started talking about lactic acidosis back in uh, 2016, 2017. But I've enhanced this information and the B1 is exponentially faster and better at bringing up oxygen, better than any other supplement on the market. And it's important for you to know all these details for yourself and the people around you. I have patients who are giving it to their family members and those family members are not complaining. They're not fighting it. They're just taking it. Nobody will argue against B1. People argue about detox. They argue about parasites maybe. They argue about mold. Oh, I don't have mold in my house. Nobody argues against taking vitamin B1. And there are so many therapies that just kind of go away when you start taking B1 because it fixes the core of the cell, the mitochondria. And when you have that going, then everything gets better. And you'll see in the research, you can search the word thiamine plus name a disease or a symptom, there's always a correlation. And if you look at the word mitochondria plus a disease, there's usually a correlation. The mitochondria is the core of cellular function. 
And when you have poor cellular function, the cells starve and die, and then the tissue starves and dies, the organ starves and dies, and then the body. It all comes back down to the mitochondria. Two weeks after I left the hospital, I called them back up and I said, look, I want to leave a message for the doctor at the emergency room when I was there on that Saturday. And they said, we don't do follow-ups. I said, I don't care about that. I want to leave a message for the doctor. And they said, okay, let me get you to a nurse that will take a message. So they did. And I said, it was a B1 deficiency this whole time. Hopefully that doctor will learn from that experience and start giving all those cardiovascular patients that walk into the ER B1, maybe some C, maybe some magnesium, that whole category of high dose nutrients, it's being completely ignored. I personally think every single person needs to take 250 milligrams of the simple B1 salt, for example, thiamine hydrochloride or thiamine mononitrate. And if you have some symptoms, then you need the fat soluble versions, whether that's TTFD or benfotiamine or both. I have a lot of people taking both. I've been on both now for seven weeks. There's no upper limit. You might just need some support products when the mitochondria start working really well. But I need you to learn all this information and apply it so that you can be part of this movement where we're getting lots of sick people well, and then some drug companies go bankrupt.